So on the agenda, first of all, so my research is on cognitive manipulation and manipulative AI. And basically the fear that I'm trying to address is that we are, um, we're smart, we're the super creatures according to a lot of biblical and religious um, sources and also generally we do consider ourselves to be the brightest on the planet. But the real worry is that what if we no longer remain the smartest and that too because of our own creation. Uh, so my uh, research is on protecting our own sanctity of the mind and protecting um, humans against mind-reading AI and manipulative AI. So in today's agenda for my presentation, I'll be first of all talking about whether mind-reading is a real threat or is it a comical, fictional idea? Um, how does uh, decoding thoughts work? How is AI currently doing this and how is it going to increase in the future? What's it going to look like a few years from now? How is it going to look like when it's a global thing? Uh, and then the ethical concerns, and lastly, I'll have a short discussion on human rights as a last defense. Uh, I have not mentioned a lot of uh, legal instruments at, in this presentation, just for the sake of keeping it simple. I'm just sticking plainly to human rights, universal human rights that you're all aware of that, are, uh, that apply to all of us. First of all, the definition of a mind reader. As we understand mind reading, it's a person who can supposedly discern what another person is thinking. So before you even say something or produce an output that shows what you're thinking, it's someone who can already tell what's in your mind. Now how does that relate to the technology that we have right now? So I think it was last year, uh, newspaper articles had headlines about this um, program developed by a student in the US who could just think and the program would write whatever the student was thinking. Now this is amazing because it can obviously help people who cannot speak or who cannot write. They can just think a thought and it would just appear and communication would be really, really easy. But the problem is that what if that's put on someone against their will and their thoughts start getting written out? Imagine you're in authority, you're in government, in a state where um, you know, you're not allowed to have certain thoughts against the establishment or the government, and you're thinking things. You're, you're, your th thoughts are of a dissenting nature as to what the political regime wants you to think. Imagine if that just starts getting written out and then that's held up against you. That's quite Orwellian as a threat, isn't it? And it's very real now because, I mean, there's a tech for it. So not in, it's, it's non-invasive, uh, you don't need a, a surgery for it, it's no installing of the chips, it's simply a, um, a kind of a instrument that's put on the, the, the head, it's got electrodes, and, um, and also fMRI scans can be used for the very same purpose of neurodecoding. Uh, so what they do is that they measure the blood flow to different areas of the brain, and then large AI models, which are quite similar to ChatGPT, can practically just write out exactly what um, the program is discerning your thoughts to be. Another example of this, now this is more, um, could, could be invasive or non-invasive as well, the BCIs, which is the Brain Computer Interface. Um, Elon Musk went, um, he became pretty famous when he spoke about this, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, and essentially what BCIs do is that they can indicate what you're feeling. So if you're feeling stress, if you're feeling pleasure, different parts of your brain light up, and that shows uh, on these scans and these graphs. So if I'm feeling fear and someone puts, I'm in an interrogation room um, and someone puts like all these electrodes on my head, they could pretty much tell that I'm feeling fear. Now that would not look very good if they're trying to interrogate me and get information out of me because it might even be vaguely an admission of guilt. So things and situations like that can pretty much occur because we have stuff like this. Now this is my area of research. And this is neuropolitical and uh, political profiling and micro-targeting. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, pretty scary, uh, very widely covered. There, there's a documentary about it as well, and there's um, a Netflix series too, if I'm not wrong. But essentially, uh, for those who don't know, a quick recap, in 2016, Cambridge Analytica was exposed for its participation of uh, manipulating voter behavior in the US uh, election in which Trump won, and also the Brexit election. Um, the Brexit vote. I think it was like a direct democracy thing. But anyway, uh, essentially uh, what they did was they collected uh, data on Facebook users and then they profiled them according to their likes, interests, activity online, what their friends were saying, what kind of posts were they more spending more screen time on, and then pushed ads accordingly. Uh, and they particularly targeted uh, individuals who were uh, in swing states, so states where they were neither leaning left or right politically, but were more susceptible to changing their minds 
that as per whatever content they were consuming. Uh, and as we saw, Trump was elected and they had a part of that. Uh, similarly, with the Brexit vote, uh, a lot of material was uh, put online in the form of advertisements, in the form of reels and certain influencers who were supporting the Brexit or who, were, who wanted to um, leave Europe. They were, their content was being pushed on user feeds and they were getting, people were getting more exposure to that kind of content. And obviously, when you get more exposure to a certain kind of content, you tend to think more along those lines. It's basic psychology. So more the exposure, the more you're likely to believe something or be, have a certain idea cons um, normalized towards you. Uh, and also, uh, before all of this happened in 2016, in, 20, uh, in 2012, uh, there was a report which is not very famous, but what it showed was that Facebook in its earlier, well, before all these acts came about and before they updated their user policy, uh, they knew and they were actively using uh, micro-targeting with adverts and they were targeting teens who were in a very vulnerable mental state. So people who were showing signs of depression, of body dysmorphia, uh, of any sort of mental, you know, like they were not in a very good mental space. Uh, certain adverts for products were uh, targeted purely for, for their news feeds and they were being sent all this material to buy and they Facebook did see an increase in sales from this kind of marketing strategy. Uh, so it's already recorded what the influence of uh, curated news feeds has on people. Now there are quite a few ethical dilemmas that come about uh, with this kind of brain or mind reading. So the mind reading part in this would be that a an AI program, um, uh, an algorithm can, I mean you must all use social media, right? So sometimes we see the content that we're being shown, is of, it, it, it is according to our likes. So if you like looking at houses or architectural designs, your Instagram feed is going to be filled with architectural designs and like uh, pictures of houses or uh, different interior decor pages are going to be more uh, apparent on your on your news feed. So um, that is kind of mind reading. I mean, you never told the program or you never really fed it in anywhere that you like houses. It's just that based on your user activity, it's kind of obvious that this is something you think about. This is something that you're interested in. And in order to increase your screen time, that very specific kind of content is shown to you so that you spend more time on the app, scrolling, looking at the kind of things that you're interested in. So. With the mind reading part, like I said, this, it can very much be used to extract thoughts or to discern thoughts non-consensually. One of the problems that the first issue is the lack of trust and fear of lack of mental privacy can make us feel like we are incapable of holding thoughts that might be offensive to either the state or whoever is trying to non-consensually read our thoughts. So imagine this. Imagine you're in a, I want to say North Korea, but I also don't want to say North Korea. <laughs> so uh, imagine you're in a North Korea-like state where you cannot think anything against a supreme leader. You do that and you're dead, pretty much. Um, and you don't like the supreme leader because you think the supreme leader is really unfair and he is not a fit to be a leader. And if you have that thought, and imagine that at some point someone suspects that, you know, or you're being put through a test where they're trying to see what you think about the government or whether you'd be a problem or not when it comes to law and order. And your thoughts are read in a way that, you know, they, they kind of know how you feel about the government or the state of affairs. That is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to either make you be a rebel, you're going to think those thoughts and like, I mean, you're going to be killed, but it's going to be for a good cause. You'll be a martyr. But the second thing is that eventually the evolutionary response to this would be to start complying. Obedience would be the response. For survival, you will maybe, or people would normally want to suppress their dissent and like not want to think those thoughts. And eventually we might end up lose our, losing our ability to think differently. And we would just be thinking what we're being told because... Uh, we wouldn't know any better. I mean, after a while, it becomes a habit of not to question things, and you start accept, accepting them for what they are. So lack of mental privacy is going to be really bad for original creative thought and for dissent. And dissent and original thought is the cornerstone of democracy. Not just democracy, but also pretty much everything else, uh, how we choose to live our lives, what we choose to eat, what, what kind of jobs we want to do. So all these things are influenced by what we want and how do you know what you want that's because you have uh, the element of critique when you're thinking things um, 
Right, so again, it translates into democratic decisions. If the Brexit vote, and in the Cambridge Analytica case in particular, uh, the, the biggest question was that is democracy even fit to deal with these kinds of, kind of threats? And it was found out that no, because people don't have free will anymore. Um, they're being influenced, not even knowing that they're being influenced, and then they're voting or making decisions that are, that are going to affect them in the long run. But they're not the ones really making those decisions, so is, is it going to work, the system? Um, so it's very much an issue when it comes to um, elections. Uh, I mean, even I feel like in Bangladesh recently, they've started using deep fakes of politicians, and um, those they're being circulated. And obviously, opposition parties they they make a deep fake of a they would make it of a political leader and then um, make it viral or send it to the or even inbox it to supporters of the other party, and then you know people would look at that material and would think you know maybe we should vote differently. And obviously, this this ties in with tech literacy. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's also a major issue. Uh, commercial influence. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Cass Sunstein. Uh, he does a lot of work on nudging. Uh, and it's uh, basically a nudge is a, a, a push in simpler words, but uh, digitally speaking, it's a, it's it's a, it's something to make you decide in a certain uh, direction. It's not really manipulation, but it's definitely a kind of encouragement to decide in a certain way. For example, uh, architectural nudging online is done when uh, there is a paywall or a uh, a sort of um, a pop up that would stop you from the from accessing the content that you want to access if you don't press certain choices, like whether it's cookies or whether it's uh, paying something or setting your privacy settings according to the way the website wants you to set them. So those are some sort of nudges. I, I hope that I kind of said it clearly. But that's an example of nudging. And nudging can also be done when it comes to advertising. Uh, so imagine billboards, colors, uh, exposure, when it comes to TV, um, jingles, all these things are all nudges. Nudges and pushes into making you buy something or making a certain decision or choosing one brand over another. Um, that being said, another issue. So let's say, for example, mind reading is a thing. Now we know there's a tech for it. There are um, mediums for it. How do we know what somebody is thinking and feeling is actually what they're thinking or feeling? For example, I'm like, I'm thinking about uh, mangoes and my food part of my brain is lighting up, right? Um, are, and like the person who is going to be reading my mind would know that I'm hungry, but they're not going to know whether I'm starving, whether I'm absolutely famished, or whether it's just like a just like, you know, a little rumble in my stomach and I just want to eat the snack a little bit. Like, they wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when it comes to um, different kinds of ideas and thoughts, um, mind reading lacks nuance. So, it can, mind, the thoughts can be read, but they can never understand. Uh, the reader cannot exactly um, discern the nuance. So, like I said, the example of a North Korea-like state, if someone is thinking, I don't like the Supreme Leader, is it going to be, I hate the Supreme Leader and I want to kill him? Or is it like, you know, I maybe don't agree with some of his policies? So understanding nuance, shades of gray when it comes to mind reading, we still don't have enough tech, like the tech hasn't developed at that point, but I don't think it ever will because human thought is quite complex and really hard to break down into uh, numbers or even words at points. Uh, that being said, um, yeah, so neuroprofiling is also something really interesting. Neuroprofiling is when, like in Cambridge Analytica, profiles are made on each individu individual, whether what they like, whether they're a parent or not, whether they're a vegetarian, whether they believe in, um, say, for example, um, all like whether they believe climate change is real, like all these things. There's a profile made on every individual as per their uh, user activity online. And once those pro that profile is made, so the more the data, the better the profile. So the more you use things online, the more the information there's going to be on you, and the more precise the micro-targeting is going to be. So now the idea is with big data and our capacity to hold huge amounts of data, um, Obviously, there's going to be so much material per person that the kind of targeting that's going to be done is going to be pretty effective. And that's a major fear because more every day, more and more things are getting digitized. We're using the internet more and more. So it's only going to get worse. Uh, okay, so epistemic authority about mental content, who to believe? This is a bit... It's a bit similar to the first point. So say, for example, if somebody, um, I'm feeling fear in an interrogation, and they tell me, and I, I tell them that, you know what, I'm, I'm actually not scared. It's just that I'm worried about um, missing my flight because I'm held in an interrogation room. Uh, and that's actually the truth, but what they can sense is simply fear. 
on the machine. If the machine is giving an output and I am saying that the output is not maybe correct, who do you believe? The person or the output? So that's also a major issue as to what do you, how do you read it well enough so that you know what the right answer is. Because like we said that machine reading is like nuance. But if a person is saying what, the mach the, what they actually feel, do you believe them or the machine? Because I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of people do end up believing machines over people because machines have, they come up with, like it, it's kind of known to be bias free to an average person, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Uh, which is not true, but um, that that's the general conception. So how do we know if somebody's lying? Do we believe machines over humans then at a certain point? So um, that that is definitely also a, a major issue to consider. But yeah, neuroprosthesis is, an, is another idea that I'm exploring in my research, and that's planting of thoughts. Have you guys seen Inception by any chance, the movie? So it's like dreams, right? And thoughts and ideas are planted in dreams. Similarly, if the access, the door is open where your thoughts can be read, recorded, they can also be planted. The door is open, right? Uh, and also like when it comes to the advertisement part, when something is advertised, political uh, propaganda, for example, uh, is planted in your mind and eventually you don't even realize it. After a certain point, your subconscious mind keeps registering it, registering it over and over again. After a certain point, you might end up voting for the party that is uh, sending you all this propaganda very subtly, like your subconscious is registering it. So after a while, I would personally feel, are my thoughts even my own? Like, you know, if, if there's I've got so much input into my brain, if I'm looking at stuff online and, and it's constantly messing up, with, it's, it's shaping who I am. Uh, who am I then? Like, it's shaping who I am, but who am I without all that stuff? So neuroprosthesis is planting of thoughts and basically manipulating thoughts to a point where you can no longer recognize whether the thoughts are your own or not. So um, you develop mistrust on yourself, and that's the worst thing, because then you have nothing else to turn to for, for uh, authentication. Uh, that is the fun part over. Now we're going to go to the legal part, freedom of thought. So we do have um, protection of thought in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the U EU, we have it in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's in Article 10 and it reads as follows. Everyone has a right of, to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. In the first part, you can already tell that it is not suited enough to be used in the context that I am discussing because it speaks very much about religion, conscience, uh, spiritual thought, not necessarily uh, creation of original thought. Um, again, it, it goes on to talk about belief, religion, uh, it talks about manifestation of religion and belief, it talks about worship, uh, it talks about uh, conscientious objection is recognized in accordance with national laws governing exercise of this right. But again, it, it's not really, again, it doesn't have that depth that we need to deal with the protection of thought that we need at this moment because when this law was being made, nobody thought at that point that, you know, there's going to come a point when without even medical intervention, someone is going to be able to read our minds, record what we're thinking, and they would know exactly how we feel. And that's why the lawmakers and the drafters could never even, like, they didn't even know that they could add that kind of depth. But now, there is discussion on this. There is a movement on the revival of this particular right and making it more suited for the future. Now comes the idea of neuro rights. Uh, there are, there's a neuro rights initiative which works on neuro rights, so essentially right to personal identity. When I mentioned the threat of like not being able to trust yourself, not being able to know who you are, so there is the protection for that. The right to free will, knowing if you want to vote for someone, knowing if you want to be um, voting for Trump or Biden or whoever, and knowing that's your actual decision out of like your free will. So anyway, that's also one right, the right to mental privacy, that is the accessing of uh, privacy of your brain, so nobody can encroach the frontiers of your mind. Basically, that's the right. And the right to equal access to mental augmentation. Now, this is a bit more transhumanist in its, in its essence. It's, it's more so that, you know, if you want to have technology that, increase, it, that makes your mind better in certain ways, it makes you superhuman, you should be able to access that kind of technology and you should be able to access the kind of health care that's around that technology. And I think that's also something maybe we can add in the, the, the response that we were writing to the haters. Uh, this, yeah, like, you know, we're gonna, that they're gonna have a right for that possibly and we're gonna be, we consider it now in our, in our movement as transhumanists. Yeah. But yeah, that's also right. And lastly, 
there is the right to protection from algorithmic bias. Now, a lot of decisions are made on, on computers, like people don't make them anymore. For example, banks decide who to give a loan to by looking at their credit score. Or if you're given a visa, a lot of your information is stored on computers, which eventually let the person who's going to give you the visa know if you have missed any flights, if you have like what kind of place you're from, what's your travel history. And eventually, a lot of things are digitized and human labor is being used less and less to make decisions. Algorithmic bias is very real. Uh, algorithmic bias exists against people of color, people of lower income backgrounds. We have seen this in a case in the US, Loomis versus Wisconsin, if anybody wants to look it up, uh, where um, a, a, there was a case against the state of Wisconsin where a lot of people were sent where a lot of people were sent uh, tax notices, but they didn't really have that kind of outstanding tax debt. And it was only because they lived in a certain part of town, which was a lower income. And then the machine, the algorithm thought that essentially, you know, everyone who lives in this area might have, might have some outstanding debt. And then they ended up sending them all these notices. People died from heart failure because it was a lot of money. It was a horrible case, but um, essentially, everyone deserves to be protected from algorithmic bias because I mean, you could be someone who is, you know, even if you feel right now in society, if you're from a, a European American or from the global North, and if you're white skinned or if you're a man, uh, you might not be, you know, in a position where you're affected by this, but you don't know how the world changes. You might end up being the bottom of the food chain at some point and you might need protection as well. So these are the kind of rights that we really need to focus on for equal protection for everyone. And also we have to ensure it's future proof so that we know that in the future, once these laws and rights are, uh, are set in place, they can stand the test of whatever new tech is going to be there. That being said, I'm happy for your questions after this. And yeah. That's that. Thank you.